The Battle of the Little Bighorn, popularly known as Custer's Last Stand, is often viewed as the last stand of the free roaming Plains Indians. The ghost dance can also be seen as a last stand, a resistance to reservation life, to being controlled by white men. But when it comes to justice for the Lakotas, there is no such thing as the last stand. We own the Black Hills, the old warrior Ironhawk told a newspaper reporter in 1948. We still do, and I wish we had the power to get them back. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs and producer of this author series. Tonight, we're in partnership with GBH Forum Network. The team there is ably producing what you see right now. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us in the land of American history, looking at the experience of the Sioux Lakota Indians in the late 1800s. Now for our introduction, Mark Lee Gardner is the author of several award-winning books, including Rough Riders, To Hell on a Fast Horse, and Shot All to Hell, which received multiple awards, including a Spur Award from the Western Writers of America. An authority on the American West, he's appeared on PBS's American Experience, as well as on the History Channel, AMC, the Travel Channel, and on NPR. Mark has written for National Geographic History, American Heritage, the Los Angeles Times, True West, and Cowboy Magazine. He holds an MA in American Studies from the University of Wyoming. Mark, we welcome you. We are so glad you're here. Um, you're coming to us from your home at the foot of Pikes Peak in Colorado. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. Oh, Cascade. Look, Cascade. Lucky you. I mean, God's country out there. And also, as you so aptly note, Indian land. Um, we really can't wait to hear more about your book. So I'm just going to quickly turn this over to you. Again, thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. And I appreciate you reaching out to me, Margaret. And it's really an honor to be part of this this series. You had a lot of great authors, so I'm happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Well, I want to um, start with kind of just uh, take a few moments um, to talk about my personal journey um, to writing this book. And uh, I'm probably perhaps one of the most least likely individuals <laughs> to have written this book, if you think about it. Um, I'm from a family of loggers lumbermen, sawmillers. Uh, my father was a logger and, and several generations back. Uh, and when I say loggers, this is in the Midwest and uh, cut walnuts and hardwoods, oaks and hickory. And as a kid, I spent many a day uh, out of school in the woods. And I ended up actually uh, in some of my summers in high school working for my dad. Um, but I uh, did not choose the logging career path. Uh, I chose to become a historian, but that also comes from my family as well. My parents, um, uh, they loved history. Um, they collected antiques. I can't tell you how many farm auctions and antique stores uh, we visited as a child. And even though my father was a logger and he's self-employed, uh, constantly working, he always made sure in the summers that he would take off 10 days to two weeks to take us on a family vacation. And now my father, uh, he didn't finish the eighth grade. He had to go work with my granddad in the, in the sawmill in the woods. My mom had me when she was 17. She didn't finish high school. So these trips were educations for the entire family, for, for my parents and for us. And there was not a historic site, house, fort, battlefield that I don't remember visiting. And one of those, which really resonated with me as a child, was Little Bighorn Battlefield in Montana, uh, that battlefield where Custer met Lakotas and Cheyennes under Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and Two Moons and Gall and others on June 25th, 1876. And it was such a powerful place, um, stark, um, beautiful, but also very somber with the uh, what looked like tombstones, markers where, where men of the 7th Cavalry fell. And I can tell you as a child that uh, my fascination was with Custer and his men, um, this great mystery 
There was no one left to tell the tale of the 200 men with Custer who were defeated that day. As I got older, I realized there were lots of people left to tell the tale and they were the victors, the Lakotas and Cheyennes who defeated uh, the US Cavalry uh, on that hot June day in 1876. I ended up as a, as a young man uh, spending summers working as a park ranger with the National Park Service. I, I uh, worked and did living history at a place called Bent's Old Fort National Historic Site in, in uh, near La Hunta, Colorado. I spent a summer um, at uh, Harper's Ferry in West Virginia with the Park Service. I also spent a summer at the uh, Stonewall Jackson House in, in Lexington, Virginia. Uh, and that started a career in public history. Uh, but the writing was something I was always interested in, in the research. And I've written several books uh, before this book, but I was always drawn back to Little Bighorn. In fact, I even wrote the guidebook that they still sell at Little Bighorn uh, today that was published by Western National Parks and Monuments Association. And, and I decided that um, I wanted to tell the story of the individuals who won and in a, in a way are still fighting and, and still pushing uh, for more victories uh, in their fight for survival of, of their culture and their, their homeland. So uh, let's go to that map. I think we need to start with the map to to get an idea of what we're talking about here. This is a map from the book. And as the title says, it's the homeland of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. And this features all the events uh, and places that are mentioned in the book, most of it occurring in the uh, mid to, to uh, you know mid to late 19th century. And you can see the homeland of the Lakotas. And I really should back up and, and talk about um, when I say Lakota. So um, what we have is the Sioux tribe or Sioux nation really. And that Sioux Nation has three divisions. Some people say two divisions. Uh, uh, you know, some people say, uh, you know, or, or I should say some scholars refer to it as the Eastern, Middle, and Western Sioux. Uh, the Western Sioux would be the Lakotas, uh, which uh, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull were part of. Uh, but we also sometimes you'll see uh, it divided between the Dakotas and the Lakotas. And the Dakotas have two divisions, Eastern and Western. And then the Western or the Lakotas sometimes are referred to as Teton Sioux, but the preferred term is Lakota. And you'll hear me mentioning that um, you know, most of the time in, the, in this presentation. The Lakota is, again, a division of the Sioux nation itself. And I want to say a little bit while we're you know, looking at this map and this country that, uh, that Sitting Bull and, and Crazy Horse lived in, and it encompasses Nebraska, the Dakotas, Wyoming, uh, Montana, and, and even across the Holy Line, which is the international border between the United States and Canada. Um, now, clearly, I, you know, we have 40 minutes, and I'm not going to be able to tell you everything that's in the book, but I just want to give you a brief background, an idea of who these men were. This is billed as a dual biography. I actually see it as more than that. It's, it's, it's a narrative of this struggle of these people to maintain uh, their their place, their homeland. And that's what we're looking at in this map. Sitting Bull, uh, he was born in 1831. Uh, he uh, grew to about five feet, 10 inches tall. Um, he uh, uh, had a nickname uh, when he was young. His nickname was Slow. And it's, it's really interesting how this nickname came about. And, and there's a lot of discussion as to what that meant at the time. Uh, according to, to one uh, Lakota historian uh, who uh, took down a lot of information about her people uh, in the late 19th century, uh, he was slow in everything. He was not a fast runner. Um, uh, you know, his, his mannerisms were slow. And so they believe that the nickname slow came from that. He wasn't a fast person. He was slow. But others say that he was slow because he was extremely thoughtful he deliberated before he made a decision. This is a really important trait and it makes slow uh, into an honorable or uh, an admirable trait and not something uh, derogatory, you know, well, he's, he's not a fast runner. Um, so, uh, and, I, and I do feel when you look at Sitting Bull's later life that that is a, an, a very apt nickname. He thought about things. He didn't, he wasn't a reactionary. He, he considered things, he mulled things over, which is what a great leader uh, should do. Now, Crazy Horse, uh, Sitting Bull's ally in his fight against the Euro-Americans, he was born about nine years later uh, in the fall of 1840. Um, he grew to just slightly under 
uh, six feet tall, probably just a little bit taller uh, than Sitting Bull. His nickname as a young man was Curly, and it was because his hair was curly. Uh, he also was a little different um, looking than, than many Lakotas in that he had a very light complexion. And because of his curly hair and his hair was also light colored, uh, some people confused him as a what was known at the time as a mixed blood or mixed heritage, perhaps a white man and, an, and a Lakota woman. Um, there's no evidence to back that up, but he had an unusual look. Um, as far as the traits of the two men, and I think this is, is really fascinating as well. Um, Sitting Bull, when he was with his own people, uh, he was almost constantly laughing. He was a very happy person, which is in such a contrast to uh, our photographs. The photographs we have of Sitting Bull, he's very stiff and somber, um, but that's not the way he acted with his own uh, people. Uh, he liked practical jokes, uh, which I think is pretty funny. Um, he uh, would say something funny, even in a serious council meeting about a fellow leader or a warrior who was there. Um, he'd really like to tell jokes. Um, he was quick tempered, but uh, according to one source, he quickly recovered uh, to his good nature. We know that he loved children and it didn't matter whether they were white or Indian, but he was very fond of children. And we know uh, from the period accounts that he also was very kind uh, to captives, uh, whether it was uh, other indigenous uh, people or, or Euro-Americans. Uh, he was unusual that he was kind to them. Crazy Horse was very different uh, from Sitting Bull and his personality. Crazy Horse was quiet. He was modest. Um, he didn't really look anyone straight in the face. Uh, he didn't like to speak in council meetings. In fact, the only time he seems to have, to have really shown emotion was on the battlefield. Uh, I believe he was probably the greatest warrior, the greatest Lakota warrior to ever live. So those traits on the battlefield were, were very important. Now, uh, an early biographer of Crazy Horse, Marie Sandoz, uh, she subtitled her book, The Strange Man of the Oglalas. Um, I don't know if anybody ever truly knew Crazy Horse, but because he was, was quiet and modest and because he didn't always look you or, or refrain from looking at you straight in the eye, this was misinterpreted uh, by Euro-Americans and they thought he was sullen and, and uh, gloomy and even uh, defiant in his actions. But he was different and the people he grew up with recognized those differences and accepted them. Uh, um, the reason I focus on these two men in this book is because they were the fiercest opponents of all the Lakotas in resisting the incursions of Euro-Americans. Uh, they uh, never signed a treaty, neither Crazy Horse nor Sitting Bull. The Lakotas called the act of signing a treaty touching the pin uh, because often uh, they used the pin to make a mark. On all the Lakotas, even a great uh, warrior, uh, that was something he regretted. I think he regretted till the end of his days, but uh, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull uh, never did. Let's go to that next slide. Um, this talk, in a way, is, is in a way um, about how I crafted this book. I, I gave you the background, a little bit of a synopsis of the personalities of these, these two individuals, uh, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, and why they were allies. Um, uh, they were uh, members of what I call in the book the anti-treaty bands. They were against treaties. Uh, some scholars call them the traditionalists as opposed to progressives, those who were willing to work with the whites. But in crafting this book, uh, you know, and writing the narrative, you're faced with countless decisions on what to include and what to exclude in order to tell your story and, and make it where somebody is not going to toss your book aside. I mean, a reader, uh, I think, will only take so many side trips, uh, what reviewers call tangential material, uh, before they put the book down, down ever to pick it up again. So you're constantly thinking of how you can hold the reader's attention and making those decisions. Um, but also a decision, very important decision at, at the beginning stage is the cover of your book, which we're looking at right now. And uh, we had a couple of different options for this cover. Now, what you're seeing is, of course, the cover of the book as it uh, now exists. And it's based on a Joseph Dixon photograph from the early 1900s that was taken at Little Bighorn Battlefield uh, when there was a gathering, an anniversary 
of many individuals who actually participated in the battle. These were great Lakota and Cheyenne leaders. And this is a photograph taken on a hill uh, at Little Bighorn uh, where uh, they had counted many coups and, and uh, had a great victory. But I wanna show you the other option that we considered. So let's go to the next slide. This uh, has its illustration, a pictograph by Stephen Standing Bear, who was a participant in the battle. Um, we eventually decided on the cover that, that you saw previously, but this was a close second. And if we go to the next one, uh, we'll see them side by side. And we're gonna do, uh, I understand we're gonna have a poll. I always like to ask my audiences uh, which cover uh, they like best. Um, I won't tell you what the general consensus is, but this is your chance. You see something popping up on the screen. This is your chance to vote uh, on which cover you like the best. And uh, we're not going to change it, <laughs> but I still find it interesting uh, to see uh, if we made the right decision. I hope we did. I think we did. I really, I, I love them both, actually. Go. So uh, we're talking about decisions. And um, really what I'm going to focus on in this presentation are some really hard decisions that I had to make. Um, I'm gonna talk about things that I ended up leaving out of the book. You're gonna see things that did not make it in. I, I really want you to read the book um, and to read the stories of these great men, um, but I'm gonna show you things here that I considered significant, important, um, but for various reasons did not make it in and I hated to leave these things out. So you're getting to see some things that are unusual, rare, um, and I hope uh, you find this a treat. Um, uh, I find that people are fascinated by the things uh, that didn't make it in. And this is one of them. So what you're seeing here is a picture of a uh, Lakota holy man named Horn Chips. And on his right is his wife. Uh, her name was Fields all around it. Now, why is Horn Chips important? Horn Chips um, was the holy man for Crazy Horse. And every warrior uh, sought the counsel of a holy man um, to uh, for what was called war medicines, charms, and we might call them a fetish, something to protect them in their various encounters and fights and battles. It, this was an important consultation. And Horde Ships was not only Crazy Horse's holy man, he was a friend, he was also a cousin of Crazy Horse. And Horn Ships provided Crazy Horse with with necessary instructions. And, and these instructions had to be followed specifically uh, for him to have protection. In fact, um, Horn Ships was, uh, was known as a, what was called a stone dreamer, stone dreamer. So many of his charms involved a stone. And he told Crazy Horse that um, he was to, before battle, uh, to wear a black stone. It was like the size of a marble uh, encased in buckskin. And it had a hole in it. And he was instructed by Horn Ships that he should wear this stone uh, under his left arm, held in place with a leather thong. He also told Crazy Horse never to wear a war bonnet in battle. And for instance, what you're seeing Horn Ships wearing there, a feathered bonnet. In battle, Crazy Horse was not to wear that. He was only to wear a single feather tied in his hair and some uh, strand or pieces or, or grass straws. And these all came from uh, or at least were interpreted by the holy man from visions that crazy horses had. Every, every Lakota warrior as a young man had a vision. And in this vision, it would tell the holy man would interpret it and then either make a war charm or instruct uh, the warrior in, as to what that meant and what he should do. And there were additional instructions. So I won't go to all of them now, but uh, there, were, there was much preparation involved. And in fact, uh, when Custer's cavalry attacked the large Lakota and Cheyenne camp on June 25th, 1876 on the Little Bighorn River, known as the Greasy Grass. Um, Crazy Horse took so long preparing and his followers uh, became very anxious and were pacing back and forth. Uh, but Crazy Horse would not vary from those instructions and uh, he did join the battle in time. But um, this was a very serious thing with the holy man instructed you uh, to do certain things, then you did those things. Um, and apparently it worked because uh, we're, it's told that um, Crazy Horse had as many as eight horses uh, shot out from him uh, under him in battle. He was always at the forefront uh, in a battle. In fact, um, the Crows and the Crows uh, were competitors, uh, enemies. Uh, they competed for resources on the Northern Plains for buffalo, uh, horses, um, but the crow said, we always recognize Crazy Horse 
because he was the closest. <laughs> he was in front of everybody else. So we know what Crazy Horse looked like. Very, very brave man and a legendary leader. So I'm telling you all this about the stone charms and the, and the war charms and the fetishes because there is a collection that I was very privileged to look at of dozens of these charms. And these charms were said to have been the war charms made by horn ships uh, for Crazy Horse. So let's go to the next slide. Um, as you can see, they're very small. That's a guitar pick at the bottom for scale. They're beautifully made. They're made out of uh, you know, brain tanned leather that's been smoked. Uh, the detail uh, is simply amazing. And, each, and, and there's actually a, a small rock or stone encased in that buckskin. Um, and each, each of these uh, fetishes is to protect or uh, do a certain thing. Horn chips not only made uh, protections uh, for battle, but he made such things as love charms uh, so that a woman would fall in love uh, with a warrior or crazy horse. Let's go to the next slide. Here's another example. Um, again, exquisitely made, very detailed. And there are literally uh, there are literally dozens of these. And I went to view these in South Dakota. They were in a private collection at that time. Um, the provenance is very good um, that it did come uh, from horn ships. And now you might say, well, this these were made for Crazy Horse. Why did horn ships have these charms? Uh, after Crazy Horse was murdered uh, in September 1877, uh, supposedly all these uh, charms, medicines were, were returned to his holy man, horn ships, and then held with the family uh, for over a hundred years um, and eventually ended up in this private collection. Let's take a look at another one. Um, I would have loved to include these in my book. Um, they're fascinating, but despite the provenance, um, I had questions that I just could not answer as far as legitimacy. Um, I was uncertain. I wasn't fully convinced. These could indeed be the war charms uh, that were made for Crazy Horse. But if I'm not 100% convinced, uh, I'm a historian. Uh, I'm not gonna put these uh, in my book. You know, when you, when you put things in your book, um, you can in a way legitimize uh, things. For instance, um, you know, there's lots of purported uh, in recent years photographs of Billy the Kid, the outlaw. Um, but there's only one authentic image of Billy the Kid we all agree on. And if I was to put one of those other images that's contested, it would be like me uh, saying, you know, well, it has the endorsement of historian Mark Lee Gardner. So uh, for the time being, I don't, I'm not convinced that these actually did belong to Crazy Horse. I mean, there are so many and there's such perfect condition. Um, so uh, I'm still torn about it. I would have loved to have included them, but this was a hard decision and they did not make it in. I understand that uh, a part of the collection, if not all of it, is now uh, in the collections uh, of the Crazy Horse Memorial near Custer, South Dakota, which has several museums or at least one large museum. And, and that's a good place for it. Um, let's see if there's one more. I can't remember now or not. Yeah, there's one more. I mean, it's just incredible. I mean. And as I said, there's dozens of these, just amazing. And I was privileged to view them. Uh, so um, anyway, let's go to the next slide. We'll leave the war charms behind for now. So this was something else that I would have loved to have included in, in the book. Um, this is another uh, Stephen Standing Bear drawing, pictograph. What's great about this, it, it's not just the battle of the Little Bighorn, but it's all the events surrounding the Battle of the Little Bighorn, um, including the famous now Sundance uh, that was held before uh, in early June near a place called Deer Rocks uh, in Montana. And the problem is for me, and I'm, and I'm going to talk about the Sundance a little bit more and why it's important. Uh, the problem for a book is that um, when you reduce it down to, you know, nine by eight or nine by 11 or whatever it is, it's, it's very tiny. Um, let's go to the next slide. This, this is why I, I love this image uh, or this uh, pictograph by Stephen Standing Bear. And he was there, he was an eyewitness. Um, 
So the Sundance was really, um, as I write in the book, the heart of, you know, at the heart of Lakota existence. It, it was a way of giving thanks to Wakantanka or the great spirit. Um, a Sundance was held, and it was, it was both religious, a social gathering, um, the different bands, uh, divisions of the Lakotas gathered, uh, usually in June uh, for the Sundance. And not everybody danced the Sundance. And maybe in movies you've seen uh, uh, where, uh, you know, a, a warrior individual uh, thongs are, are, are punched through their, their, the flesh of their chest. And uh, these are attached to, to uh, you know, uh, leather ropes that are tied to the holy pole or holy tree, which you can see, you can see this in the center. There, there are individuals, you know, pulling against, um, you know, these thongs until the skin rips and, and they break through. Um, why would these people do this? Um, the reason for that Sundance is uh, to honor a promise to Wakantanka. For instance, um, a warrior a Lakota, as they're going into battle, might offer a prayer and say, Wakantanka, if you protect me in this battle, I will dance the sun dance for you. Uh, and uh, that's uh, why they would go through this. Sitting Bull, uh, before, uh, at this particular sun dance in, in June of 1876, he asked Wakantanka for protection and food for his people. Um, now, he didn't dance the sun dance like you see here, um, or at least with the tethers. Uh, he what he did what they call he, he gave flesh, and uh, he had fifty small pieces of flesh cut from uh, one arm and fifty from the other arm. And after this was complete, um, he danced. He promised he would dance for four days and four nights. Uh, so, and I should also mention that in preparation for these dances, uh, these men also fasted. So they were dehydrated. Uh, they were weak, and then they're dancing. And you also hoped during this dance that you would have some kind of a, a vision. And the reason this Sundance is so important uh, is because Sitting Bull had perhaps one of his greatest visions. I should mention that Sitting Bull was not only a leader of the Lakotas, but he was also a holy man as well. And he was known for his ability to uh, see the future, uh, to predict things that were going to happen. And uh, he had a great vision that foretold the future at this sun dance. Uh, he danced and danced and he didn't look at the sun. That's, that's a misconception or misnomer. Uh, these men looked just beneath the sun. And as he was staring up there uh, beneath the sun, he saw uh, long knives, soldiers coming and, and falling and their heads down, their hats were falling off. This meant that they were dead and there were many of them. And he also saw uh, Indian warriors who were falling from the sky as well. And he heard uh, a voice and the voice said, it was referring to the, the long knives. He said, uh, I give these to you because they have no ears. Uh, they didn't listen. Um, and he also was instructed, this voice told Sitting Bull that his people were going to have a great battle, which was represented by these uh, dead soldiers and warriors, um, but that his people were not to, to take any of these spoils of battle, saddles, horses, guns, they were to leave all that on the field. If they, if they touched these spoils, Sitting Bull was told that his people would suffer. Um, another thing he was instructed to do in this vision, uh, he was not to personally fight in this battle. He could have a bow and arrow for his own protection, but he was not to, to fight, um, which actually would have been kind of out of character. Um, Sitting Bull at this time was considered uh, what was called an old man chief. Um, he was 45. He wasn't super old, but at that age, uh, these uh, older leaders were not expected to fight like the young men who were teenagers at the time. So all these things were told to Sitting Bull in this vision, and uh, uh, it ended up coming to fruition on June 25th uh, when uh, uh, the Seventh Cavalry attacked the village uh, and were defeated. So I would have loved to include this because it's such a significant um, uh, event in Sitting Bull's life and his story. Um, but just because of the format of the book, uh, it just wasn't something that, that was going to work. But I'm glad I can show you this and we can talk about that Sundance now. So let's go to the next slide. One of the things I do when I'm researching a book, um, 
I have a, a, a separate file just for quotes. Um, I like to start a book and chapters with an epigraph uh, because epigraphs, I, I like to find quotes that, that really uh, present the essence of what I'm trying to say in a line or two. Um, it's almost like I'm always amazed at great poems or, or wonderful songs, how they can condense these big stories into beautiful uh, two or three lines. Um, to me, a great epigraph is like opening uh, the finest perfume in a large room. Uh, that scent carries across the entire room, even though it's a small vial. So that's the way I, I want epigraphs to set the stage for the reader. And this is one of my favorite. This is the, that opens the chapter to the surrender of Crazy Horse in, in September of 1877. After their great victory at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, um, uh, this huge village uh, started to split up. Um, they couldn't stay together for really more than a few weeks. Uh, there were you know, several thousand individuals in this village um, and it took a lot of forage for the horses. Um, some accounts say that the horse herd might have numbered 10,000 horses. So you can imagine how much grass uh, was needed. The wood along the river quickly used up and, and you know, the game in the area hunted out because, uh, I mean, again, it was just too many people to keep together and, and to keep fed uh, and safe. So the big village splits up. And of course, the reaction in the, in the, to the United States government is that we need to uh, put a stop. We need to, to end the free roaming days of the anti-treaty bands and specifically those under Crazy Horse and, and Sitting Bull and Two Moons and uh, who's a Cheyenne by the way and others. And so uh, they go after them in the winter. Uh, the US military knows that the Lakotas are at their weakest in the winter. There's not a lot of forage for the horses. It's hard for them to travel and they go after villages which was kind of the standard, uh, that was the standard tactic uh, in the what was called the Indian Wars uh, at the time. Uh, they went after villages um, uh, you know, the US military, whether it was cavalry or infantry, usually cavalry, they were not encumbered uh, with their wives and children. They didn't bring all their belongings along with them. They were able to strike anywhere at any time. Whereas the uh, Lakotas, uh, all their possessions were with them. Um, they followed the Buffalo herds. And so they brought their, their hide lodges. Um, they had their children, uh, their wives, um, they were very vulnerable then, of course, uh, when a village was attacked, and especially in the winter. So, of course, uh, was eventually, uh, he saw no option but to surrender in the spring of 77. Sitting Bull went across the Holy Line into Canada and spent four years up there before starvation also uh, brought him to the conclusion that if his people were to live, that he was going to have to go back into the United States and, and uh, yeah, accept the mercy uh, of the white man. So um, this epigraph here by uh, Father uh, Pierre-Jean de Smet, it is not possible to change the nature of any race of men in a moment. It's, it's so apt as to what the U.S. government was trying to do to the Lakotas. Um, Crazy Horse had been free. Uh, no one had ever told him what to do or where to go. And all of a sudden, he's faced with uh, an Indian Bureau. He now has an Indian agent. Uh, the Indian agency is next to a fort. So you have the military uh, who are also involved. And they're all trying to change him and his people. They're teaching him how to bake bread uh, with flour. Uh, he's now, uh, instead of hunting buffalo, they're bringing beef cattle in. Um, you know, is an interesting story. The Lakotas, they were hunters. They chased the buffalo. It was exciting. It, it, it was part of their life. And when the beef cattle were brought in, um, they asked if they would turn the cattle loose and let them hunt them down, chase them down and kill them because they had always chased the buffalo on horseback. Very tragic, sad. They're trying to maintain their lives, but um, the restrictions and their situation or not allowing it. And, and Crazy Horse had probably had more trouble than most. And literally a few months later, um, uh, they decided they're going to arrest him. And because a rumor had circulated that he had plotted to kill uh, General Crook, it was a false rumor and, and generated by jealousy of other leaders. 
uh, but he's murdered in, in his horrible arrest attempt. And, uh, you know, they were trying to change these people and Crazy Horse was unchangeable. Um, he was free. And, and when he saw those bars on that guard, guardhouse, he resisted. He tried to flee and, uh, and he was murdered. So uh, I think for this chapter, that, that was the perfect epigraph. And I could go on and on about the cultural genocide, which was inflicted upon not only the Lakotas, but others. But that's exactly what was happening. Uh, they were trying to erase their culture. Um, so let's go to the next slide after that long introduction. So this is an epigraph that I, I really liked. Um, but no matter where I tried to place it, it wasn't working. I didn't want it at the front of the book. The Indian that says he likes a white man is a liar. And the white man that thinks an Indian likes him is a fool. Uh, we know Sitting Bull said this, but I thought if I place this at the front of the book, um, Sitting Bull is a very bitter statement. And he was bitter at times, but um, he wasn't really a bitter man at all. I discussed earlier how he joked and laughed and, um, you know, he loved children and he was a he was a human with a personality. And and uh, I thought this this presented him or um, in, a, in a kind of a negative light. It, 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 I still wanted to use it, but it just wasn't working. But I wanted to talk about this and share it with you because there's something that he says here that happened time and again in relations between uh, Euro-Americans and Indians. You'll often see where uh, a white man says that, um, you know, I was a, a great, great friend of Sitting Bull uh, or I was a great friend of Crazy Horse. But we don't always have what Crazy Horse or Sitting Bull thought about these men. We don't know that it was reciprocal. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's good to look at this critically and, and ask yourself, you know, uh, well, maybe, maybe this guy thought Crazy Horse was his friend, but was it really, uh, was it a shared friendship? We don't always know that. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is John Burke. John Burke was the manager for um, uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And in 1885, he traveled to the Standing Rock Reservation and to see Sitting Bull in, in, in along the Grand River in North Dakota. And Sitting Bull, uh, he wanted Sitting Bull to join the Wild West. And uh, apparently he took, you know, according to John Burke, it took like four weeks or something to convince Sitting Bull to go. And I should tell you the reason Sitting Bull went was because he, um, uh, he wanted a chance to speak with the Great Father and advocate for his people. And that's why he agreed. It wasn't because he, you know, had a high opinion of himself or, or had a huge ego. He was promised that he would see the president. And that's a whole other story. It was very disappointing for him. But um, we don't always get the relationship that Sitting Bull formed with with individual uh, that he had contact with in the Wild West show. And so let's go to the next slide. When Sitting Bull was murdered uh, during the Ghost Dance Movement in December 1890 at on Grand River, where he lived, uh, the news, of course, raced across the country, across the world. And John Burke, the man who had negotiated with Sitting Bull, uh, he sent this telegram to the agent it says, uh, save me some memento of bull, a lock of hair. With all his faults, I liked him well. And I just thought this was so reflective of, of you know, what Sitting Bull meant, um, that he wanted to hold on to that memory. And, and he was saddened that Sitting Bull was gone and just wanted something to remember him by. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, some things get left out because I, I um, make huge mistakes, and this is one of them. Um, so if you do, or if you um, were to uh, ask uh, uh, Lakota to, uh, at that time, to write their autobiography, what they would do would um, recount all their coups. And a coup is something you touch an enemy, you um, uh, capture a horse, uh, you kill an enemy. And Sitting Bull did several pictographs representing various coups that he had um, was credited with. And this is one. Uh, this was when uh, uh, he was being chased down, down by General Nelson Miles, him and his people. And he's uh, showing how he killed a Crow scout. But what I missed when I, and I made this photograph, this collection is at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Um, 
what I missed or overlooked is uh, the note um, at the bottom. And each of these drawings, uh, he told the post trader at Fort Randall, and these were done when Sitting Bull was a prisoner of war at Fort Randall. He described what was in the scene and the post trader wrote it down. Well, what's significant about this last image is uh, uh, Sitting Bull is saying that he is wearing a war bonnet that once belonged to Crazy Horse. And people often ask me about, you know, how close were they? And, you know, we know they were friends. We know they were allies in their fight against the Euro-Americans and preserving their homeland. But here Sitting Bull is making it known. It's important. He wants the viewer to know he's wearing a war bonnet. Now, you may remember I said that Sitting Bull was not, I mean, that Crazy Horse was not to wear a war bonnet in battle. It doesn't mean he di didn't own one. He just wasn't to wear one in battle. Uh, so this got left out of my book. I came across it again when I was preparing a lecture, and I am very happy to say that it will appear. It's already in the second printing of the hardbound. So if you got a recent copy of the book, you'll find this image in there. And I know we're getting kind of out of time. Let's go to the next slide. So this is kind of the last thing. Uh, well, will this will be the last thing here for this talk. Um, I really wanted to include this. I'm going to read this to you. I went through thousands and thousands of pages of uh, documents in the uh, National Archives. And this uh, letter uh, was written in 1881. And I'm going to read part of it. It's written to uh, General Terry uh, at Fort Snelling, Minnesota, who was in charge of this division uh, that, en that encompassed the Missouri River and Standing Rock. He says, Captain Paul Boynton, the aquatic navigator who intends swimming from head of Yellowstone and down the Missouri River to St. Louis, Missouri, requests me to ask you, if possible, for you to have an order issued to the troops and forts on above route, informing hunters and others of his proposed voyage, in order that he may not be mistaken for anything different and probably shot at. As this, had, as this has been the case in several places in more civilized parts, he thinks an extra caution more necessary on the present route. So he's wanting uh, this military officer to warn uh, that this kind of odd thing is going to be coming down the river and don't shoot at it. So let's take a look at Captain Boynton, the aquatic navigator. He was also, oh, next slide. He was also known as the fearless frogman. This was billed as a life-saving suit um, and it was used to save uh, people in shipwrecks or what have you. And, and Captain Boynton made all kinds of improvements. Uh, I guess you would call it a dry suit today. But you can see where if maybe this thing is coming down the river, you might think it's some creature. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, it looked like someone in a, like a kayak and he floated on his back. Usually there was an individual behind in a, in a small boat. Uh, in 1881, uh, he had a journalist named James Creelman who accompanied him down the river. He actually went from, from Montana all the way to St. Louis. And the reason I'm bringing him up is that he actually stopped at Standing Rock and he visited with Sitting Bull. He met Sitting Bull, uh, Captain Boynton, uh, the fearless frogman in Sitting Bull had a meeting. Next slide. And indeed, uh, there was an incident on this journey where he was almost shot at uh, by an American Indian along the river. This was, this was uh, depicted in the Police Gazette of 1881. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the things that Captain Boynton loved to do uh, as he floated by towns uh, on the river, he would shoot fireworks off of his stomach. It was quite a, uh, it was quite a show, uh, very unusual. He was really famous at the time, um, but not so well known today. I think he deserves his own book, actually. Next slide. Well, I'll end it here. This is, uh, again, Captain Paul Boynton, and he's part of P.T. Barnum's, uh, I believe this is Coney Island. Um, I hated to leave this out, but, you know, it just didn't work. Uh, to include Captain Boynton uh, in my story and his meeting with Sitting Bull. But uh, I love the story so much that I wanted to show a few images here. So, Margaret, I think that uh, concludes the slideshow. What a wonderful slideshow. I, uh, I particularly love that last uh, gentleman who floats floats in the water. Um, <laughs> the fearless with, frog man. Yeah, and he, he should have gotten into um, Buffalo Bill's wild show. I mean, what I agree. Thing. And P.T. Barnum is very good, though, uh, to yes. place to be. Um, first off, I have to say it's a real coup, you writing this book. Um, oh. 
a really remarkable thing. I've never read anything like it. It's a really brilliant narrative. So, um, so well, thank, thank you. you for doing that. And I am uh, purely a medium for others' questions. So I'm going to start in on those. Um, a number of them center around your process for writing and researching your books. Uh, can you just generally talk about, um, you know, this book versus past books or, you know, how you do what you do? Sure. Yeah, this this book was a real challenge. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I did not grow up Lakota. Um, I mentioned, I, you know, I'm from a logging family in Missouri. Uh, but as a historian, um, I want to use primary sources. And as I researched this book, it, it was critical for me. I wanted to tell the stories of the people who, who fought with Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, uh, who were relatives of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. Uh, so I used dozens of oral histories um, that fortunately were gathered um, in the, uh, actually starting right after the Battle of Bighorn up until the, the early 1930s. Um, people like Walter Campbell, who had the pen name Stanley Vestal, uh, he went to the Standing Rock Reservation and uh, to other uh, places where the Lakotas lived and uh, got their stories. One of the, one of the, some of the best sources he had were the nephews of Sitting Bull, uh, One Bull, and um, this is One Bull here. This is an original cabinet card of One Bull. And uh, he surrendered with Sitting Bull in 1881. And uh, he was interviewed extensively uh, during his lifetime. Uh, and I should tell this for those people that want to research, all those interviews, and there are dozens of notebooks that have been preserved. Uh, they're at the University of Oklahoma uh, Library, and they've been digitally scanned. So when you see in the back of my book of the notes, and I say one bull interview notebook number two, whatever, you can go check it on me, and you can actually go online and look at that page or go through the whole notebook. Um, so that it was so valuable to have those uh, interviews recorded. Another set of interviews that were very important. Um, uh, two young women in 1930, Eleanor Hinman and Marie Sandoz, went to the Pine Ridge Reservation, and they interviewed people that knew Crazy Horse. And one of his closest friends, He Dog, they interviewed him. Those those interviews are foundation stones for anyone researching the lives of Crazy Horse and really this period of time uh, for the Lakotas. So there's a lot of primary sources out there, but I I just made sure that um, you know, and I and I'll also say that I purposely did not interview living Lakotas. Um, I wanted to, to the accounts of people that knew Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. I wanted eyewitness accounts. I'm a historian. I'm not a folklorist. Those stories that, that exist in those families today are important, uh, but I wanted to tell my my story through the eyes of the people that experienced those events. I should also say that, that are, there are some really important sources uh, um, that have been published, primary sources. I was going to show um, um, you know, as far as like, uh, not only do we have these, uh, you know, transcripts from interviews, but um, there were also Lakota historians. Mm -hmm. This is a great book. It's called Eyewitness, a Pampa Historian Strong Heart Song of the Lakotas. Look how huge it is. It's thick. Um, this was, this collects the accounts uh, of Josephine Wagner. She was a hunk papa and she made it her life's goal to preserve the stories of her people. And uh, this is the comp compilation of all those accounts. Um, you can also find uh, when Crazy Horse surrendered, uh, there was a census made. And if you wanna know everybody who surrendered with Crazy Horse, it's actual photographs of that census. And so we know every family, every individual. Uh, so um, even published books are, are actually primary sources as well. Another fun book, um, this was written by the great grandson of Sitting Bull. And uh, I had the privilege of getting to meet him uh, a few years ago. So just because it's a book doesn't mean it's not a primary source. And so uh, I encourage uh, our audience to go out and, uh, and, and, and you know, look at these books that are uh, include the accounts of the Lakotas themselves. I tried to incorporate as much. And at the back of my book, um, I have two pages that list all the uh, uh, Lakota sources and Cheyenne sources that I used uh, to write the book. That's a that's very very helpful. One of our um, advanced questions asked if you uh, where you found these oral histories. You said the University of Oklahoma. Um, were there any also at the Library of Congress? Um, there's a guest here of the Library of Congress. Did you do much research back east? 
there's not um the the it, the, it, the so not really oral histories per se but there is important information back east for instance the uh um the national museum uh, of anthropology which is part of the smithsonian they have a lot of these sitting bull pictographs uh they also have lots of photographs and images um of uh you know by other uh, drawings by other uh, indigenous peoples as part of their collections and those have been digitized so you can go online and uh, take a look at those uh, they even have artifacts that have been photographed and digitized uh, that are available online as, as well so there are resources um, you can also uh, for instance um, uh, Yale uh, their library they've digitized some primary sources uh, uh, some by uh, uh, actually George Bent who is a Cheyenne a warrior and and was involved in some of these uh, battles that I talk about in the book. So they they are out there, but mostly what I used um, were uh, you know found at archives in the West, um, but also the Newberry Library, in Chicago, a lot of stuff there as well. So yeah, yeah right near Northwestern. Uh, yes, I mean the the northwest of our country used to be right there as we know. Yes. Um, we uh, have a number of folks that tune in from Canada, and that border is quite fluid um, in terms of genealogy and obviously in terms of um, Native American history and fur trapping and all, all of the above. Uh, so we have a question here. Did your research turn up new information about the four years Sitting Bull and his followers spent in Canada? Uh, another question, tell us about Sitting Bull's stay in southern Saskatchewan um, after the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Yeah, that, that's a that's a perfect question for what I was talking about today, and, and again the decisions that you make. So yes, yeah, Sitting Bull's people fled to Canada after the battle, and um, it, it's just interesting the 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 way that Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse looked at their fates after that battle. Um, Sitting Bull thought, you know, the best thing to do was to go to Canada and to live to fight another day. Crazy Horse, um, what he said was why should I leave the land that belongs to us? You know, it's like, if I end up dying here, maybe that's what's going to happen, but I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to be forced off my land. I'm going to, I'm going to stay here. Uh, and he did die there. Uh, but um, Sitting Bull and his people uh, and, and many other Lakotas, in fact, uh, after Crazy Horse was killed, many of his followers fled to Canada as well. And at one time there was something like 4,000 Lakotas uh, in Canada. But as I alluded to earlier, um, the Canadians weren't real keen on having uh, all these Lakotas there because there were other tribes that were there already. And so, the, you know, they had just as much of a problem with the bison herds uh, as they were south of the border. And uh, there weren't enough resources to go around. Sitting Bull's people, uh, I mean, it was basically starvation. And it was a very long, depressing four years. In fact, it was so bad that they they sold their horses. I mean, the horse was, I mean, that was a part of their lot. I mean, that's how they were, they were mobile. They, they, you know, they actually sold these animals that, that, you know, allowed them to be, you know, Lakotas. And so it was horrible. Um, and anyway, in my book, uh, what I ended up doing and, and to answer the question, it's not that I really found anything new about the time uh, in Canada, but um, I didn't spend a lot of time on that. And that was a purpose, purposeful decision because Again, it was, you know, it was kind of the same old story for four years, but there are some really great books that have been written just about that period. And so I would recommend a book that came out a couple of years ago by Robert Utley, and it's called The Last Sovereigns and published by the University of Nebraska Press. And it chronicles that time, that four years uh, in Canada. But it was a decision I made that I summarized it in about four or five paragraphs in my book. Um, but it was, uh, you know, from 4,000 people and when Sitting Bull surrenders in 1881, he actually had like 186 people with him. I mean, it, some Lakotas did stay. There's there's actually Lakotas descendants that stayed in Canada and are still there. Um, but, um, you know, when Sitting Bull surrenders, he's down to 186 people and they're destitute, absolutely destitute. And that's why he returned. Uh, we have a lot of questions also about Crazy Horse. And then I'll return to a few that are coming in online. Um, two questions. One is... Are there photographs of Crazy Horse? Do those exist? And the other question is a burial spot for Crazy Horse. Have those ever okay. been covered? So both of those on Crazy Horse. Great, yeah, great questions. Uh, 
So uh, as far as we know, there is no existing photograph of Crazy Horse. There are candidates that um, I'm not, you know, I don't, none, none of the uh, uh, scholars, knowledgeable scholars accept these as pictures of, of Crazy Horse, but it's, there's an intriguing possibility uh, after Crazy Horse surrendered in May of 1877 uh, at Fort Robinson uh, in southwestern Nebraska, he, uh, uh, there was a photographer at the fort. His name was James Hamilton. And, you know, uh, he photographed uh, soldiers, but he was also photographing Indians. And uh, we know he took several images of uh, Indians from the, the Red Cloud Agency. I should say the Red Cloud Agency and Fort Robinson were right next to each other. So, um, what James Hamilton ended up doing, he published, uh, and a lot of photographers did this in the 19th century, he published a little catalog of all his, quote, Indian views. And in that catalog, uh, they're, and they're all numbered, and there's one that says Crazy Horse. Now, the, the, that number that's in the catalog, we've never found. So we don't know if it's actually a picture of Crazy Horse or not. We, we've never seen it. But we would know for sure if it was Crazy Horse because Crazy Horse had a horrible scar on his face. Um, this occurred after he had uh, absconded with another man's wife. Uh, that man, no water, chased them down and surprised Crazy Horse and shot him point blank with a revolver. And it was a pretty ugly scar. So if, if a picture ever came up uh, that was identified as Crazy Horse and he has that scar, uh, then that would be a pretty good uh, evidence uh, that uh, it's Crazy Horse. But I've got to say that the people that knew Crazy Horse, um, you know, one of the one of the interpreters there at Fort Robinson, he was asked, and he says, no, that was just not, you know, and, and we talked about this. Crazy Horse was modest. Um, he kept, you know, he, he was, you know, almost shy, you might say, and it just wasn't part of his personality to, to have something like that done. One um, surgeon at Fort Robinson, uh, he had encouraged Crazy Horse to have his photograph made and Crazy Horse supposedly said, um, why would I allow someone to steal my shadow? You know, and maybe he said that, maybe not, but there's a lot of evidence that he would never do that. Um, but there's that little slim possibility if we could find that numbered photograph in that catalog uh, and see if Crazy Horse is the person in the photo. Oh, and the other question, there was a follow-up to that about the burial. Yeah. yeah. So um, after Crazy Horse was killed, um, his family uh, took his remains and eventually um, they uh, buried them, uh, stored them. And some people don't say buried, but his body was placed in a, in a crevice or uh, in somewhere in the Pine Ridge area. Um, and apparently his body was moved like three different times. Uh, so no one knows the exact location uh, of Crazy Horse's remains, which I just think that just adds to the mystique, right? No photo. We don't know where his remains are. I mean, in a way, he's everywhere. Uh, I think that's the way it should be. Um, Love that thought. Sitting Bull, unfortunately, yeah, Sitting Bull, unfortunately, um, did not rest in peace. And there's a whole, I have a whole part on that in the chapter. And, and uh, but his descendants, they would like to do the same thing that happened. At least the last I read in, in news reports, they felt like we want to do the same thing that happened with Crazy Horse. We don't want anyone to know uh, where Sitting Bull's remains are. Thank you. Um, we're just going to clip through some quick ones from online. Um, we want to know what the, the figurines um, the, that you showed early on, what are they made of? Are okay, they so they're made of brain tanned leather. Oh, okay. Buckskin. And then often, you know, you saw some of them, they may have a stone encased in them. You know, as I mentioned earlier, Horn Chips was a stone dreamer, um, but they're primarily made of, of brain tan buckskin. And part of the brain tanning process, you smoke the, the leather. Um, uh, they're quite beautiful, yeah, um, they are. but they're not in and the book. <laughs> the, um, the symbols around the chapter numbers, those sort of beautiful sort of, they look kind of like woodblock prints. Are there certain oh. symbols around the chapter numbers? Yes, well, I'm, I'm so glad that somebody noticed that. Um, I, uh, you know, in, in discussions with the designer of the book, I sent them uh, a uh, examples of 
Lakota beadwork and uh, quill work patterns. And so throughout the book, they tried to incorporate those designs into it. Um, so that's that's what those those symbols. I'm so glad somebody noted because I was very proud of that. They're um, beautiful. They're really beautiful. Right. Um, okay, and then a last online question. Um, if the Lakota followed the buffalo migrations, how did they determine where their territorial borders were? Uh, well, um, they didn't. <laughs> I mean, uh, they, the Lakotas especially tended to go where they wanted to go. And if they went into crow lands, I mean, that was fine with them. They stole crow horses and, and uh, you know, they were prop, I mean, they were the most powerful of the Northern Plains nations. So uh, they really didn't recognize uh, boundaries. But I will say this, um, the United States government tried to give them boundaries um, in the various treaties. Uh, I mean, it's, it's almost comical if it wasn't so sad. But uh, in one of the, the early, four, I think it's the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty, I mean, they had all these nations get together and they had a big map and they were deciding, okay, this is going to be Crow land and this is Lakota land and and, uh, and you know, you're not supposed to go into their territory or whatever. And that's just not the way uh, it worked. And one of the comical aspects, uh, uh, one Indian was observing these white men around this map and they were making these lines. And he went up and he said, could you put a few buffalo in our area? Because we're not, we don't have a lot there. <laughs> you know, like they could just create something or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, it was tough. This, this whole thing of lines was completely foreign. Uh, to Lakotas. And what I think is so great though too about these lines, what they did understand was if they went across this holy line into Canada, the US cavalry wouldn't come after them. So they understood that part. It's like, you know, hey, wow, we can go over here and they're not going to follow us. Uh, so they understood that. But other than that line, they really didn't care. You know, they went where they wanted to go or where the buffalo were, I should say. Yeah, where the buffalo roam. Um, we are coming to the end of our time, but as we do for all our American Inspiration author events, we have asked uh, Mark if he would read to us from the book. Um, this has been so interesting, and I think the reading um, will help us to understand even more. So Mark, back to you for that. The Battle of the Little Bighorn, popularly known as Custer's Last Stand, is often viewed as the last stand of the free roaming Plains Indians. The ghost dance can also be seen as a last stand, a resistance to reservation life, to being controlled by white men. But when it comes to justice for Lakotas, there is no such thing as the last stand. We own the Black Hills, the old warrior Ironhawk told a newspaper reporter in 1948. We still do, and I wish we had the power to get them back. 32 years later, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed with Ironhawk in a landmark case known as United States versus Sioux Nation of Indians. The court affirmed that the Black Hills had been wrongfully taken from the Lakotas. The 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty plainly stated that land sessions required the signatures of three fourths of all adult male Lakotas. The government had obtained only the signatures of chiefs and headmen when it took Lakota lands in 1877 and chiefs friendly to the government at that. The Lakotas were awarded more than $100 million in 1980. That figure was based on the value of the land in 1877. The 1877 value of the gold stolen by miners from the Black Hills and a 5% interest per year for a century. But the worth of the Black Hills was much higher than that figure in 1980 and even more so today, to say nothing of the hill's spiritual significance for the Lakotas. Like Ironhawk, modern day Lakotas want to get their sacred Black Hills back. They refuse to accept the payment, and it supposedly sits gathering interest in a Bureau of Indian Affairs account. With that interest accruing annually, the award has reportedly grown to nearly $2 billion. Many Lakotas today live in some of the poorest places in the country, but as an Oglala leader explained in 2011, if we accept the money, then we have no more of the treaty obligations that the federal government has with us for taking our land, for taking our gold, all our resources out of the Black Hills. We are poor now, we'll be poorer then when that happens. The refusal of the money is also about honoring the many ancestors who lived and died defending Indian lands and culture. 
I want you to hold these grounds, Sitting Bull once said to his people. I want you to follow me. I want you to pledge yourselves to what I ask of you. Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull never signed a treaty. They resisted the white invaders to the end. If these great leaders were alive today, they would shout how, how, in approval of the words spoken by one Lakota man in regard to the effort to return the Black Hills. They are the words of a warrior. We won the battle against Custer, he said, but the war continues. Thank you, Mark, for your insight and for this call to action to really understand what went on in that time period. It's really inspiring. Um, again, we've learned so much about the time, about our country, about the Sioux and the Lakota um, history that we need to know. Um, so back to tonight, um, back to American West. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to our great producers at GBH Forum Network. Um, thank you also to the audience out there in Zoom land. Um, we are grateful to you for tuning in, for your questions, for your interest in American history, the good and the less good. The stories, as Mark says, they are all out there and they should be researched and they should be written about and read about. So we hope that you'll read his book and we hope you'll come back for more such talks. For now, from Colorado and from Massachusetts, Mark and I thank you and we wish you a very good night.